Hello, brothers and sisters. It's Gary and Jeff again. It's been a couple of weeks since we came to you, and we wanted to share some thoughts that are pertinent to right now. There's a lot going on, of course, and one thing that's clear is that this world is quickly heading off a cliff. Uh, not only that, but the church and those that believe in the Lord and Jews around the world are uh, increasingly under threat. We can see this new world order rising up out of the sea, so to speak, the sea of the Gentile nations. And that's what the scripture prophesied. So for a while, I didn't think that we would be on the earth to witness what we're witnessing. But this isn't the tribulation yet, uh, by no means. We haven't seen the global judgments, the seal judgments that are unleashed on the world, but we're getting closer. And so that means that the rapture is that much closer. And I wanted to talk about just briefly the fig tree. So, so we've talked about this a lot before that Jesus parable of the fig tree, which is often quoted from Matthew 24 is a picture of the final generation and that the fig tree does indeed represent the nation of Israel. And some people take issue with that and they say, well, no, this really just means that when that generation that sees these events, these signs that Jesus is describing in the Olivet Discourse, when they see these things happen, they'll live to see them completed. But the signs Jesus is talking about in Matthew 24 are tribulation events. The tribulation is a seven year period. So it doesn't make sense for him to give a parable in which he talks about a generation of people, if a generation is only seven years. That's not a generation. A generation is the length of life of a person. So um, that's important to keep in mind. He talks about that that generation would live to see all these things completed, all these things fulfilled, including not only the Great Tribulation, but also his second coming, which is described just a few verses prior to the parable of the fig tree. The fig tree in scripture is a picture is a representation of national Israel that's really important and some people take issue with that and they say no uh, Israel is the olive tree or, or Israel is the vine or something like that and that's really picking apart scripture that's saying that okay these are scriptures we'll emphasize that talk about Israel as the olive tree or Israel as the vine but we'll ignore the ones that talk about the fig tree and that's not the way scripture works because there are a number of symbols in scripture given that represent Israel. Israel, yes, is represented sometimes by an olive tree or by a vine. Um, Israel is called God's firstborn son. Israel is also called God's wife in the prophets. So there's different symbols of Israel. And one of those is the fig tree. It's the same thing with the church. We've emphasized that in Revelation 12, the male child in Revelation 12 is not actually Christ because it's a future prophecy. And so Jesus, his life was a template. And then Revelation 12 is, is based off of that template, but it's a future prophecy of the church. The male child is a corporate entity. It's the church. And so, yes, the church is the bride of Christ, but the church is also the male child. It's the singular seed that is mentioned in Galatians chapter three. The church is also a spiritual temple and there's different symbols in scripture for the church. The church is called one new man. So to say the church is only the bride is mistaken, just like it's mistaken to say that the, the Israel is only the olive tree. So another thing that I wanna mention is just Psalm 90. We talk about this a lot, Psalm 90, 10 that a generation is defined in that psalm as being 70 years or if by strength 80. Is it fair to connect that with the parable of the fig tree? Because Jesus says a generation, that final generation will live to see all of those final end of the age prophecies fulfilled. And I think that it is actually because Psalm 90, the context is actually judgment and perhaps even tribulation things. And the traditional author is Moses. And so there's some connectedness between Psalm 90 and Deuteronomy chapter 31 and 32, in which Moses even prophesies of the end of the age, of the latter days of Israel's history. 
And so I think it really is connected. And so people will say, well, that means if we're here past, you know, May 14th, 2021, that we've, we've missed the boat or that this parable can't mean that. And I think again, like we shouldn't be putting God in any kind of box. That's a silly thing to do. That parable and Psalm 90 tell us that we are at the end. We are very close. And the reemergence of national Israel was a super sign. The biggest sign of all that we are really are in the end of the age. We are really are in the last days, even if simply because so much of scripture is about Israel, pretty much the whole old Testament is focused on Israel. Psalm 90 puts, you might say an upper limit of 80, but Israel will be 80 until the spring of 2029. And so what I think right now, this is my speculation, my lean, is that there is going to be a gap between the rapture and the commencement of Daniel's 70th week. And I mentioned that in 2018, I wrote an article called The Day of the Lord when I outlined how I foresee the events in Revelation unfolding. And I, I think that we'll actually witness a couple of the seals open from our vantage point in heaven before the tribulation itself begins. That's just my perspective because I see the first seal in the traditional dispensational sense, which it's the, the antichrist rising to power. He's revealed after the church is removed, but he hasn't yet made this big peace agreement confirmation with Israel for some period of time, probably a short period of time, but some amount of time. And that, that's a, a pretty widespread uh, belief. And there's some really well-regarded scholars like Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum, who holds that view as well. And in fact, in his book, Footsteps of the Messiah, he even said that we, the church would witness the beginning stages of the new world order shortly before the rapture. And then when the rapture happened, then the Antichrist would be revealed and he would take all that stuff, all, all these, these wires that have been run, and he would just flip the switch, kind of like what JD says, that everything's being wired up. And so we are, we're in that stage now with coronavirus watching the new world order rise to power and it's going to be handed over to the antichrist on a silver platter as soon as the church is removed which is very soon so i think um, i'm anticipating the rapture happening in days weeks or maybe a couple of months and then that the tribulation would begin this fall and before you move on gary i just want to add a brief note about the fig tree and someone who would question whether the fig tree relates to this generation of Israel in the land. And I, I would say, don't just think about Matthew. Look at Luke. When you look at Luke 21, starting in verse 29, Jesus says, when you see the fig tree and all the trees. And Luke has a particular Gentile emphasis. This is the same chapter that even mentions uh, that there is an escape for, from all these things that he's discussing, all this judgment in the tribulation to come. So we're talking about you don't just need to look at Matthew, and it's not just the Olivet Discourse. We're talking about look how even in Luke, which we know has a Gentile emphasis that he is saying there is a unique generation where Israel, the fig tree, is replanted, begins to prosper. And then there's other nations that come out of all these monolithic empires, like the toes at the foot of the statue of Nebuchadnezzar. There's only one time like this in history, and this is it. It's the wicked generation that Jesus was a part of, which he said, Nothing will be given to you except the sign of Jonah, which was his resurrection. Well, we're doing a replay of that. What's going to be given to this wicked generation of Israel and everybody else surrounding them, all their neighbors they're going to be entering into a covenant with? The resurrection. Aha! Times two. The sign yeah. of Jonah. <laughs> yeah, and Jeff, I think people, they, they're so used to what they know and what they've experienced that it's hard for them to 
really recognize to step outside of their own little sphere and compare our experience in this generation with you know the history of the world it's so different like we are in a very unique generation not only because of israel but because of technology and all of these signs that are unique to really just the last 100 150 years and mm -hmm. a recent article i talked all about that how everything about this this last one or 200 years is totally unique mm -hmm. very strange that it's all converging and it's all happening simultaneously and you know talking about the fig tree and all the trees those are symbols of nations nation states mm -hmm. and throughout the history of the world for millennia in millennia uh, both before christ and after christ history was defined by these monolithic empires you go back to nimrod after the flood you know it's an empire and then you have basically you know you have babylon and syria and Persia and all, you know, Egypt and Rome, they're all Rome. these huge empires that controlled vassal states. And then even post Ottoman, Ottoman, you know, post BC in, in the 80, the common era, it's the same thing. And so, you know, for, for a very long time, there were major European and East Asian empires and stuff that dominated, but that sort of disintegrated, particularly after world war one. And we are now in the era of the nation state, but we're seeing that that's coming to an end because the empires broke up and dissolved and became these little fragments. And now they're all being joined together into a one world government. Mm -hmm. and that's what the antichrist is going to step into. And we see that happening right now with coronavirus, that national boundaries are, are evaporating pretty rapidly actually. And that's, that poses a real danger to the church. That's part of why we have to leave. And then another topic I wanted to cover is the biblical festivals, of which there are seven described in the Pentateuch, the Torah. There's Passover, which begins in the first biblical month uh, called Nisan. There's unleavened bread and then first fruits and then Pentecost. And then in the fall, the fall festivals, you have trumpets, which actually can sometimes be at the latter end of summer. And then you have atonement and tabernacles. So people think there are seven biblical festivals, but there is some overlap here. So unleavened bread sort of overlaps first fruits and tabernacles is followed by the eighth day assembly called Shemini Etzeret, which we've talked a lot about. And there's been ongoing debate in Judaism regarding whether or not that's actually its own festival. Is it an eighth festival or is it the end of tabernacles? So there's a little bit of mystery and tension there in scripture regarding that festival. So there's endless debate about which of these festivals best aligns with the rapture. And I tend to think the rapture will happen on a day that has great beauty and symmetry and stands out. And that seems to be the pattern of how God's worked in the past. So Jesus died on Passover. He became our Passover, our sacrificial lamb. And his sinless body was buried in the tomb, just as the unleavened bread is covered. And then on first fruits, he became the first fruits from the dead. He rose again to life, he came out of the tomb. And then on Pentecost, the church was conceived or born when the Holy Spirit was given. And so the church in that way kind of became like a wave offering. And there were the tongues of fire that settled over their heads. And the dispensation of law began on Pentecost at Mount Sinai, and the dispensation of grace began on Pentecost in Jerusalem. So there's that kind of connection. And so these really significant events in terms of um, salvation and redemption, they occurred on the festivals. But it seems to be that the final fulfillment of trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles is yet to happen. And I, I suppose that it's very possible that Jesus was born on trumpets. A lot of people think trumpets of 3 BC, September 11th or so. And he may have been conceived on tabernacles, actually. Well, the second fulfillment of tabernacles, which is called Hanukkah, in 4 BC, so that he could be born on trumpets. 
So there may have been like an initial fulfillment of these fall festivals, but there's still an ultimate fulfillment to come. And that's why a lot of people think that the tribulation will begin and end in the fall. But, you know, which of these particular festivals really stands out as the rapture? Is it the, is it the Feast of Trumpets? That's what I would think that the majority of watching believers would say. And I would say there's a lot of typology there that makes sense because Paul talks about how the rapture will occur with the trumpet call of God and at the last trump. So there is a trumpet's connection, but the trumpet is not just blown on the quote unquote festival of trumpets. The festival of trumpets is actually called in scripture Yom Teruah, which is like a day of shouting or the day of the awakening blast. And that doesn't necessarily imply a trumpet. It could be someone shouting with their voice. So other festivals the the camp of the Israelites would be gathered with trumpet blasts and the sacrifices would sometimes be given with the sound of a trumpet. So that connection may not be absolute with the feast of trumpets. And then a lot of people think it could be Pentecost. So that could make sense because the church age began with Pentecost. It could end with Pentecost. It could be sort of the marker in the middle the fourth of seven festivals it's right in the middle so maybe it marks the church age both the beginning and the end that makes sense and i've argued that shemini etzret the eighth day assembly could be possibly a picture of the rapture and the point i'm trying to get at is that there is typology or symbolism in all of these festivals that could be tied to the rapture. And so I don't want any of us to get dogmatic about a particular festival, but really to keep scanning the horizon for what's closest to us so that we're awake to what's right in front of our face. We see all the signs converging. So what's it gonna be? I have my leanings. I think a lot of people have their opinion of what's most likely, but right now I have my sights actually set on Purim and then probably first fruits. So in the Torah, there's the seven festivals that God ordained, but there are actually two other festivals in scripture that come later and they are in scripture. So there's Purim from Esther and there's Hanukkah, which actually is mentioned in uh, John chapter 10. So the biblical calendar goes from spring to spring or the month of Nisan to the next month of Nisan, the next year. That's the biblical calendar. And if you think about it in terms of the order, Passover would be the first festival, followed by unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost, and then trumpets, atonement, tabernacles, and then Shemini Etzeret. And then the next festival in the Bible would actually be Hanukkah, which tends to be around the uh, first few weeks of December. And then the final festival that's actually meant, that's actually in scripture or has its basis in scripture is Purim. And that this year is the last week of February. So there is some interesting connections given that Paul talks about the last trump. And in Jewish history, there were times when they would actually blow trumpets on Purim for the celebration. So it could have a last trump connection. It's the last festival in the year. It could represent the last trump. And then it also ties in, which we'll talk about a little bit more with the dragon standing ready to devour. Because in the book of Esther, we learn about this plan that was concocted to destroy all of the Jews and how Esther, God used Esther to step in and undo this plan. So Esther, in a way, is a picture of the church, the bride of Christ. So keep in mind the signs in the heavens that have been playing out, especially since 2016, 2017, which we've gone over like so many times just to remind everyone of how clear this picture is of the conception of the birth of maybe even the rapture subsequent to the sign of the dragon casting down a third of the stars of heaven. I mentioned a few videos ago how after the great conjunction in December, it appears that Satan gets left in the dust. He gets cast to the earth And Jupiter is ascending. There's even a movie that came out a few years ago called Jupiter Ascending. Talk about predictive programming. So Jupiter represents both 
Christ and his humanity when he was incarnate, but also the body of Christ here on earth before we're glorified. And the, the enemy, Satan, he's waiting and standing ready to devour the baby, the corporate male child, the church. So there was the conjunction in December of Saturn, which represents Satan. And we've pointed out how clear that connection actually is, even from scripture, conjuncted with Jupiter. And so Capricorn is depicted as this hybrid entity, this horned goat. Satan is frequently pictured in iconography and stuff as a, as Baphomet, as the horned goat. And Sagittarius is a perfect depiction of the first seal every detail, every word to a T, the bow, the crown, and a rider on a horse. There's so much about this that comes right out of Revelation chapter six, the first couple of verses. So the church was caught between rock and a hard place, between the antichrist and Satan standing ready to devour. But Satan gets left in the dust, Jupiter ascends, and then Right around the end of January, Jupiter passes the sun and, technically speaking, becomes a morning star. So it could be a picture of the glorification, perhaps the resurrection of the church. And I wanted to show what visually this looks like in the morning from the vantage point of Jerusalem. It's like the church is in the belly of the beast after the conjunction with Saturn. And here comes Venus, the bright morning star, representing Jesus Christ according to the Bible itself, Revelation 22. It appears that Venus is descending, conjuncts with Saturn, which is a picture of Satan. So this could in a way be symbolic, a reminder of Genesis 3.15. And then right in the belly of the beast, Venus and Jupiter conjunct on February 11th, which is about two weeks or so before Purim. And I think that this could be the conjunction that most closely represents 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the Lord descending from heaven to meet the church in the air. So it's Jupiter ascending, Venus descending. Jupiter is already a morning star, so it's like the church is glorified, and now we meet the Lord in the air. And so I'm not saying that the rapture is happening on February 11th. Of course, not saying that, but I think this could be a picture of it. And I think that the second sign, Revelation 12, the dragon standing ready to devour, the dragon casting down a third of the stars from heaven with his tail, that that may have been fulfilled in December last year with the Gemini's meteor shower on December 14th, which happened at the same time as this great solar eclipse over South America and really close in time to the conjunction, which was December 21st. And then that happens. And then the dragon is poised, ready to devour. And then our rescuer arrives on the scene to snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. Okay. All right. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. I am going to, now pick up where you left off. I'm going to build on this Purim theme. And this is the perfect time to share with everyone a phrase that the Lord spoke to me in one of those mysterious ways that a lot of you can relate with. This occurred during the hours in the morning between sleeping and waking that's when I get a lot of those flash visions or the word that the Lord speaks right before I'm conscious. But it's almost like, you know, he couldn't get a word uh, in edgewise. So he gets it in right where uh, it's that last moment where I, I wake up and I go, oh, wow. Uh, what was that? I need to write that down. Well, thankfully, uh, Brother Brad <sighs> has been uh, my diary, his site, Revelation 12 Daily. <laughs> I frequent Revelation 12 Daily and have been for quite some time. I really love and appreciate the fellowship and the, the family 
very much like unsealed. It's like twin, uh, twin sites and, and a very similar spirit. And so I had jotted this down and I wanted to share this with, with you all because the word that the Lord gave me two years ago, I thought was just something personal. I thought it was just for me. But as time has gone on, I've realized that it's much more than that. He was really confirming what many of you already know and what, we, what we've what we seen play out uh, over time, what we're seeing right now in the world. And it relates to Purim and it relates to Holocaust and the dragon seeking to devour. So this wasn't the original comment that I, that I made. The original comment was actually made on February 10th, 2019. So this date is relevant. It is or exactly two years from when I, when I made note of this. So I heard on the morning of February 10th, I heard this phrase, Mordecai advancement. That's all I heard, Mordecai advancement. And thought it pretty strange. I knew probably had something to do with Esther. I, I thought too, it might just have been a personal word of mine. I ended up getting uh, let go from a job a month or so later. So it definitely didn't apply <laughs> to me getting advanced in that way. <laughs> um, so this just goes to show you sometimes your original thought of what the Lord says that does not mean what you think it means. This didn't show up. So this just goes to show you how the Lord operates sometimes. He gives me this word, February 10th, 2019. It doesn't resurface until January 23rd, 2020. So one, two, three, January 23rd, 2020. This is when I make a comment on Brad's side. I come on here and I say, wow. Fast forward to today, I was at my job and on January 23rd, 2020, during the afternoon, I'm, I'm answering calls and I get a call from one of the company's employees who has in their name, Mordecai. And they're calling to ask if their promotion has gone through in the system yet in the HR system. And that's when I get this chill, you know, the, the Holy spirit is reminding me, Oh my Mordecai advancement. I was blown away. I was, I was like, what is going on? I said, yeah, this, the hair stood up on my neck and I knew right then it was the fulfillment of that word back on February 10th, 2019. So here I run, I dig it up and brother Miguel says, Hey, there feels like there's more to it. Turns out there was, there was more to this because then on another post on February 11th, 2020, I realized with the help of brother Dan and Lewis that on 123, when I got that Mordecai advancement confirmation, when the Lord confirmed that word, look at some of the look at what was going on that day. It was the fifth annual World Holocaust Forum in Jerusalem on January 23rd, where many world leaders were in attendance. And I immediately thought about Haman from Esther, who is planning a Holocaust to wipe out the Jews, okay? It was 777 days after Trump declared Jerusalem as Israel's capital on December 6th, 2017. It was uh, 29,777 days after the Evian Conference in France where world leaders met to discuss, what do we do with the Jews? Prior to, this was before World War II broke out, and they're still wondering, 
what do we do? The fig tree, right? You know, the, the, the <laughs> it's like this is before the, the fig tree and people, are, the nations are still wondering, what do we do with the Jews? And it was 70 years from the Nesset's recognition of Jerusalem as the capital. It, all of these things on this one day, January 23rd, where the Lord had confirmed this Mordecai advancement was all these things that had to do with Jerusalem. It had to do with the Holocaust because it was the fifth annual world Holocaust forum. And there was so, so much that, that confirmed that, Hey, this is sometimes how the Lord operates. He'll give you a word, but it takes some time. Be patient because then boom, one day out of the blue, you're visited, it's confirmed, and there's more digging going on. So let me just share with you what I believe. This is not just a personal word of encouragement to me, although it definitely does speak to me as far as I'm waiting for that time when the Lord advances me and, the, and every one of you who believe in the Lord who are going to go up and get promoted, the biggest promotion of all. And I wanted to show you how this theme of the Holocaust, just like Gary showed you in Stellarium, everything that's going on in February, in mid-February, the very time that I received this word, Mordecai advancement, look at what all is going on in Capricorn, this constellation of sacrifice, of slaughter, of the goat, you know, this devourer too. This is right after, this is coming on the heels of the sign of the dragon seeking to devour the child. And what do we see right now in the world? In fact, I'll say we can only see it if we have eyes to see, because there is such a blindness to what is really going on. You've got many distractions and many people are exposing many different things, but there's one overarching plot, one overarching conspiracy that is so disturbing that it's hard to stomach. But the word of God is clear that there is genocidal murderous plot that is inspired by satan himself that is being rolled out and the gallows are being constructed right now and in the gear the, yes literally i mean even literally yes people are saying there's what are all these you know guillotines for so in Esther, in Esther 5, this is one of our third day passages. So on the third day, Esther puts on her royal clothes. She appears before the king. This chapter in Esther 5 parallels Revelation chapter 12. Think about all the, the connections. You've got the king and the queen who's just been enrobed. She is shown grace in the king's eyes. She's given a golden scepter. The church, the male child in Revelation 12, 5 is given the rod of iron to rule with Christ. There's the accuser. The accuser is present. You have the same courtroom type setting in Revelation 12. However, Haman goes forth he goes out so it's like satan he's going out remember to and fro but mordecai is is the one who uh had earlier exposed a plot against the king it was recorded but he was never rewarded for it it was just jotted down in the records and Nothing ever came of it. But look at, look at the parallels. Haman becomes enraged. Haman, full of fury against Mordecai. 
This is what is pictured in Revelation 12, that once Satan is cast down, once he leaves the presence of the king in the heavenly court, he is full of wrath, because that's what Revelation 12 says. Woe to the earth, because the devil is full of wrath, and he goes after the Jewish people. And we see this in Esther. So another, another facet to this Mordecai advancement word that I got was another encouragement, another word of encouragement about being patient until the Lord reads from the book. Because <laughs> Esther 6.1 begins, On that night, the sleep of the king fled away, and he commanded uh, his servant to bring the scroll of memorial, which is, in other words, you see translations say, Book of Chronicles. Um, book of records literally in the hebrew it's it's book of remembrance it's uh sefer hazikaron so it's the it's the same word this word zikaron it's the same word that we see in malachi 316 it's practically the same phrase sefer it has the same word remembrance so is a book of remembrance so in malachi three sixteen, when god reads from this book of remembrance just like the king in the story in esther we will be promoted advanced and that's just what happens finally mordecai is recognized you know, for this deed that he did for his labor is not in vain and that's a word of encouragement for every one of you just as paul says in first corinthians 15 one of the very last things he says in that chapter is that because of the resurrection and rapture, your labor for the Lord is not in vain. You will be rewarded. Keep going. Lastly, I wanted to mention Esther 7.9. This is really interesting. Esther 7.9. First, let's read it from the, the LSV. LSV actually has the literal translation here of not gallows per se. It's not plural, although many English translations say that Mordecai was constructing gallows. And that's in a lot of English translations. However, it's literally the word etz, the Hebrew word etz, which is tree. So it says, behold, the tree that Haman made for Mordecai. It's it's standing in the house of Haman in height, 50 cubits, and the king says, hang him on it. So this device of death that Haman was constructing is this Hebrew word right here, Strong's 6086, etz. It's a very common word in the Hebrew Bible. It occurs, look, 329 occurrences. That's a little 923 there backwards. It's the same word that you find in Deuteronomy about cursed is the man that is hung on a tree, which Paul picks up in Galatians. It talks about how Jesus became a curse for us so that we could experience the blessing of the Abrahamic covenant and the new covenant. So this word is, is found. It's very common in the Hebrew Bible. However, what makes this interesting in Esther 7, 9, is the height. Okay, pay attention to the height because we won't use the cubits here because that's foreign to most of us, I would say. But a lot of our English translations will relay to us that it was seven, 75 feet high. Whatever Haman constructed, you know, that he was... It was grandiose, you know. I mean, he, he constructed this towering device of death, this tree that was, let me find another one, 75 foot, okay, tree. 75, right here, 75 feet. Okay, you got, you got the height. Now, without without the modern search engine with all the algorithms, I don't even think this would have ever come up. But you know how it goes sometimes. You go, hmm, 
I'll just plug this in the old search engine. I just typed in Rockefeller tree height, 2020, 75 feet. <laughs> the tree, the Christmas tree that they put in Rockefeller Square every year during this time of the Great Conjunction in 2020 was 75 feet. Now, this is why. Is this random? No, not at all. I don't think so. Remember, Haman constructs a tree of 75 feet tall, the gallows, so to speak. So he's trying to hang Mordecai on it. Well, Rockefeller, the name, should ring a bell for many of you. They're one of the sponsors of ID 2020, the Rockefeller Foundation. ID 2020 wants to basically mark, you have a digital ID for everyone on the globe. When you go to their main site, not just the Alliance section, it actually says certification mark. I mean, <laughs> digitally, right? So it's like you it can't get any more biblically creepy than that. So you've got the name Rockefeller associated with this tree, 75 feet tall. They're part of ID 2020. Well, they were also the, the Rockefeller Foundation also put out this thing called Foundation and Global Business Network. I forget the title of it, but it, they put it out in May 2010, a, a report. It was produced by the Rockefeller Foundation that envisioned the likely creation of a technological police state in response to a deadly worldwide pandemic. And this has already been surfaced online, lockstep. Some of you have heard it as uh, Operation Lockstep. So let me just, let me just tie it all and a bow here. The word that God gave me, February 10th, 2019, Mordecai advancement. He confirms it almost a year later on January 23rd on World Holocaust Forum Day in Jerusalem with all of these other sovereign numbers that only he could do to enforce that. All of a sudden, we're seeing the signs in the heaven confirming that the dragon is seeking to devour and then in real time, we're seeing evidence. We're seeing evidence of a plot, a conspiracy, a worldwide global plot to enslave, but not just to enslave, but to kill, to murder. Pastor J.D. Farag, this past Sunday, I'll put a link. I'll put a link to his message. I I highly recommend listening to his most recent message. It confirms what I just shared with you, that we are in a very, very sobering time, that this is not an easy message to communicate. But neither is hell. But hell is in the Bible. It's very difficult to try and convince someone that there are elitists in this world who believe they are far superior than you, and you are just livestock to them, and they don't care what you have to say or think. There is an evil that we're seeing today manifest. And it is this lead up toward the final slaughter that we read about in the book of Revelation, where we see many tribulation saints that are, that are going to be slain. They're going to be imprisoned. Everything we're seeing la that is being laid out right now, that's how, that's how we know how close we are because we have an escape. And that's what Gary showed, that the signs in the heavens are confirming what we know the Bible teaches, which is the Lord Jesus Christ is coming to get us because there is an escape from all of these things. Look up. Look up. When you see these things begin 
to come to pass. This is what Pastor JD, he spoke in his message and I echo, which is when you see these things begin. Why does Luke have this emphasis? Because we need to make a distinction. There's a difference between the church and Israel. We have a different trajectory. Good thoughts, Jeff. And this brings me back to the belief that many have, and I understand it. I can empathize with it that times are going to get better (laughs) and that maybe Biden isn't even really the president. Maybe the military is still going to step in and turn the tide. Maybe this is some big sting operation to capture all the deep state and all the bad guys and all the pedophile ringleaders and all these people and throw them in jail. Military tribunals are coming. And it reminds me that we put out our last video, I believe the day before inauguration day. And I remember actually thinking about it and praying about it because our message was don't put your faith in men. This is not going to go the way you want it to go. Right. And I remember praying, Lord, what if, what if we're wrong? Like, but there's really two camps of Christians. There are those who recognize things are getting much darker and that's what the Bible prophesied. It is going to get much darker because there's this whole thing called the tribulation that has to happen for prophecy to be fulfilled for Jesus to come back. That has to occur. But there's another group of Christians that, they may say that's going to happen, you know, far off in the distant future, or they may actually say it's never going to happen, that we've misinterpreted prophecy. And in reality, the church is going to take over and we're going to be victorious here on earth. And we're going to implement the kingdom. And then Jesus will, I guess, come and inherit that from us. That's dominionism. That's NAR and all these things. And there were a lot of these prophets like Kim Clement and others who said that Trump would, and like Mark Taylor, that Trump would have a second term, that he was going to beat the deep state. That did not happen. And I'm, I'm sorry. I know there are those that think that this is a sting. It's not like Biden stooge is now the uh, chairman of the joint chiefs of staff. Like he has his people in place now. The military is not supporting Trump. Trump is not the president anymore. It's not going to happen. And according to prophecy, it has to get darker. The church has to be under threat. The scenario that the Bible presents is that the dragon is standing ready to devour us. And that's how we have to be pulled out. Because according to Jesus, the gates of hell will not prevail against us. But the gates of death will prevail against tribulation saints. They will all be overcome completely. Mm -hmm. So we're not up in And there's a different message of salvation to those now, which is simply faith alone in Jesus Christ alone versus the message of salvation for those in the tribulation, which is do not take the mark, do not worship the beast and give God glory. And of course, also believe Jesus died for your sins. But that's important. And I think I I hope that as believers that are awake and watching, we can finally put this to rest. We need to be looking up. We need to be looking to Jesus, not looking to Trump, not looking to anybody on earth, not looking to the military. They're not going to save us. They're not going to rescue us. And things are not about to get better and all this stuff. Yes, well said, Gary. I think there's so many that align with with the thought that, you know, we shouldn't be discussing these things because it's it's such a a downer you know but that's why we insert the gospel that's why we make it about seeing the lord jesus and how it's it's this plan of god look especially for those who have been really feeling the the constraints and knowing that you feel it. The dragon is seeking to devour. We can even tangibly feel it. And and even loved ones are being affected by it. We know that the enemy has been plotting and conspiring 
to build these gallows. But our sovereign God, before the foundation of the world, has planned for our redemption and our, our escape. That is where we're putting the final emphasis. We're saying, no, look at your hope. Your hope is in Ephesians 1, 4, that he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless, to be presented before him as a spotless bride without blemish. And it just so happens to be before Israel's labor. It just so happens to be before this final fig tree generation enters into a covenant with her neighbors to build the third temple and reinstitute the sacrificial system. We're not going to be here to see all that. Our escape is now because we're seeing the signs for it. Like we were just shown earlier, Gary showed you everything is going on in Capricorn, the constellation of slaughter, of sacrifice, of Holocaust. There is a Holocaust being planned. That's what Holocaust means. It comes from the Bible. It, it means it's a, it's a burnt offering in a sense. It's a slaughter. And we're not appointed for that trial. Revelation 3.10, right, Gary? What is, what is Revelation 3.10? Yes, because you kept the word of my patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial coming on the whole world to try the inhabitants of the earth. That is a promise to the church. We will not be here during the tribulation. It's a promise, not just from there, but from, from many, many places in scripture. And so we hold on to that, knowing that even though it looks dark, this is the church's Red Sea moment. We're about to be taken out.